extra mile to get you from Absa, going off the beaten track to find solutions. The 2008 Toyota Kalahari Botswana 1000 Desert Race continues, and the driver's briefing for day three just outside Gaborone, Botswana was tense only. Roll, the teams knew that it would be a hard day, and they already had almost 600 k's of racing in them bones. For Mark Grenier, the lead would mean only one thing, no dust. Well, I'm really happy to be out in front. Um, yesterday we had quite a, a lot of dust and uh, I think today, you know, we're going to try and keep it neat and tidy and let the other guys work for a change. So that's the plan. Whether it pans out or not, we'll have to see, eh? The dice is certainly set up nicely. Foss, Woolridge, Taylor, they're all there, ready to bounce. Yeah, look, I think it's uh, it's going to be a tussle all year, you know, and at the end of the day we've got to just take it one step at a time and just pick it off slowly but surely and uh, I think uh, if we get it to the end, we'll be there. As for Force, the pressure was there. They had to judge it just right on the day. Look, it's going to be another long day. Uh, we're going to try and not make mistakes, but also we're going to try and beat the Toyota in front of us. Uh, the pressure's on. We, we need to have, to have a good, clean, fast run. Duncan, you're only 80 seconds ahead of the Ford. You'll have to watch Neil Woolridge carefully. Yeah, we've got a little bit of a gap on the Ford, but he's, uh, we're all within a couple of minutes of each other, and uh, he's going to be right there. So, yeah, we've got pressure from the front and from the back, from behind. Anthony Taylor and Robin Houghton had a great day at work, despite fatting twice and exercising some arm muscles. We had quite a good day. I was running very well in the, up in the front there, and then uh, we had a, two punches, which cost us a little bit of time. But then the last 100 k's of the top loop, uh, we lost power steering. So, you know, to drive that, that big truck with no power steering for 100 kilometers is pretty, pretty difficult. And uh, so there I lost another, I reckon, about 12, 15 minutes perhaps. So, I mean, on the whole, I was running strong. Um, I got radio contact with the team and they told me that I was catching Duncan at the time when the power steering failed on me. I was only three minutes behind. So, yeah. It was going very, very well. I'm glad that um, Mark's in the lead. Um, he must have driven a, like a bat out of hell, you know, to get where he is. But um, yeah, we'll keep the pressure on and let's hope for a brilliant result for Toyota. It was. In the specials, the gloves were off. Yeah, well, I'm uh, in a very comfortable uh, position. Got a bit of a dust gap behind the guy in front of me and then uh, the car following me is like five minutes behind, so. A nice position to be in, if we can do what we did yesterday and only get out of the refuel or the end, we should be doing, uh, we should be doing okay. Shamir Barayawa was in great form even though he and Siegfried Rousseau had their own troubles in the total porter. Yeah, look, uh, it's, it's five minutes between myself and Nalus and, um, well, yesterday considering we came from 23rd position, passing all those cars in the dust, the whole day we drove in dust, so I think that um, hampered the time a bit with, uh, and then we had a tough pump blow up on us, so we uh, stopped for five minutes to see what we could do there. So I think our pace is right, and uh, we'll keep to the same pace today, like yesterday. And uh, hopefully we'll get up there. I mean, it's still another 500 k's. Anything can happen, you know. But the guys uh, did a perfect job on the car. They worked the whole night, and uh, the car's fine. When all the talking was done, it was Cronier who was away with all the pressure of leading the longest of the eight-race ABSA off-road championship calendar. A tense final day lay ahead. And one of the men who would make a tense was Foss. He hit the road next. The defending national champ would rely heavily on his fitness and stamina on this long day. And Arnie, he and Weichelt were meshing into a better unit with each passing minute in the cockpit. In contrast, Woolridge and Schulthammer have been together for donkey's years and were more than able, ready and willing to apply the pressure. Then in the specials, it was Alberts and Minnett who never even had to get out of their car on day two. They were hoping for a replay. Cronier, reigning national rally champion with Birkin, had it going sideways in typical style and started off in a big hurry. Force driving right on the limit was pushing hard. He wanted to wipe out that small 17 second advantage quickly. And don't think for a second that Woolridge and Schulthammer were not following the same modus operandi.
Robertson minutes streaked away from the line, but were headed for disaster. Soon after this, they hit a rock, broke the rear suspension, and that was their race run. Bariyawa, still on a high after the birth of his second child just three days ago, was driving like a man possessed. Rousseau had to hold on for dear life. With comrades marathon runner Nick Harper and stand-in nav Andrew Chalupski in the turquoise Atlas Copco bat in third, chasing dust. Facade Mardenhorst followed next. Their Hilux was looking and sounding great. As for Matthews and Smith, they weren't exactly holding back either. Let's go in car. No role, they weren't exactly, and for a reason, the Century Property Bat was being boldly pursued. Cox with former national champion Henny Testierka at his side was quick, but according to Alfie, not quite quick enough in the motorite SP. But this man, Anthony Taylor, certainly was. Bush or no Bush? And that's not an American political joke, I can assure you. Yeah, that's what you call hell for leather driving. As for the Sulbalts, Father Cully and son Quinton, they were doing the same thing. Krobler, the veteran of track rally and off-road, has not had a very pleasing season. One win and a lot of battling, but he was back in the thick of things here on day three in the Navarra. Whitehouse and Carlson in the Regent Racing Bat were super steady and got quicker as the day wore on. But the thick Kalahari desert sand made it a test of upper body strength, power steering notwithstanding. At the Marshall Point, Marsh and Grunewald were quick and effective. With the Barcaisons going quickly in the Bloemfontein-based Ruhrkon Toyota, they were up from 15th place and mowing down the opposition. Stablemates in the Rokon bat, the Whites were also gliding along early on, leading Class P quite handsomely. With Poseidonite and De Brain setting the pace in Class B. And De Brain and Brits trying to chase them down in the second place. Swanepoel and Sullivan had made a giant stride or two in the SB class and were finally up into the top seven after starting quickly. And Fontonda and Guapa had the bit between their teeth too. The Ford loved them loose sand. Class D, the front runners, the Zamatans, had extended their lead over the Race Onyx boys. But in this sport, like all the others, a never say die attitude is vital, and Lavaskakni and Harbe were far from hoisting the white flag. Peckham and Santora were flying the Ford flag with style in Class E, and still leading, but unfortunately for them, not for long. because these gents were bearing down on them, Fissa and LaRue, in a spirited mood in the team Barberspan Toyota. With the brothers beside note in the Adenko bat in second position in Class P. And back to Class D, where Duploy and Von Furen were up into the top three after coming from 48th overall after the prologue. With Van Bredan de Toy pushing the envelope in Class E for a podium finish. That's right, Arnie, and they were pushing because the Bezeda notes were right on their tails. 
No quarter asked or given, but up ahead and setting the pace after the first hour of racing, it was the Castel Theater of Cronier and Birken. The young Rudiport driver pulled ahead to a 1 minute and 46 second gap. But the rest had certainly not given up the chase. Only 20 minutes separated the first seven teams. In the specials, it was Variawa and Rousseau who had stormed into the lead after the Rapsar Bat had succumbed to the desert's harder objects after just 30 k's. Here, only 20 odd minutes covered the top 10. It was hard racing. Foss and Weichelt in the Nissen then made a big push and Grandier let him go past. And the man wearing number SP6 was content to let Foss find the way, but it meant that the Castrol Toyota crew were on a dust diet. Woolridge and Schulthammer were biding their time in the Ford Ranger, but lost some time due to a puncture. They weren't exactly having a lot of luck with the stuff on the wheels. And in the special vehicle class, Variawa, who has been hunting for a win here for 15 years, was perfectly set to clinch the deal. But there was still a long way to go. As our camera tracked back, we found Krobler and more in the second Nissan, chasing as only the burly man can. After all, he first won this one way back in 1984. Harper and Chilovsky came by next, getting every ounce of power out of the Atlas Copco bat six litres. And ditto for Colin Matthews and Alan Smith in the Century Property Developments bat, who were a model of consistency. Michael Whitehouse and Matthew Carlson were rock steady in the region racing bat, but were battling overheating problems. Choking in their dust, it was Taylor and Houghton in the second Hilux. The manufacturer's battle was on too, as matters stood, only 10 points separated Nissan from Toyota and Ford, and all three manufacturers were hell-bent on solid performances in the three classes. And now back to the specials, where the Silvolts, defending champions, were enjoying their new bat, but also overheating. But Mr. Cool, Alfie Cox wasn't having any troubles, at least nothing major, just one puncture. The 23-time national champ was enjoying his desert joyride. Enjoying his desert joyride. Well, that's stretching the truth a little, honey. But anyway, for Terence Marsh and Peter Krunewald, a steady desert approach was working well, but then Cox ran into grief. We've got an electrical problem, uh, we've got no battery power, and I think the alternator stopped working, so... Obviously without the alternator, it ain't going anywhere, so... I don't know if we can find something to get it going, just to the service point. We've only got 17 k's to go to the service, so... But it was a great day today, I mean, we've come up right behind Nardis. I think that was fourth on the road, and uh, then all the trouble started, so... We've had our fair share, but this is the desert race. You get dealt, one day you're up and the next day you're down. And uh, unfortunately, we need a bit better preparation and uh, hopefully we'll... Well, it's good to see you near the front again. Isn't it? Yeah, I know. It was having a great race. Man. Yeah. Anyway. A philosophical cox, but no time for that for the Ruacon team of George and Sharon Parkhazen. Up into the top ten and flying along. And Bez Bezadenite and Johanna Brain were comfortably setting the pace in the B-Class. In fact, they had more than half an hour to play with. Henry and Maurice Matten appeared next into the top ten for the first time in the production car class. And right on their tails, it was P-Class leaders, brothers Johan and Etienne Bezadenite. Team Barberspun SP pilot Chris Fasani's co Yapi Bardnost, it was the end of the desert road. Yeah, we. We were sitting behind the car for the whole morning and like maybe 20 kilometers and. Uh, 
it was like a swerving the road. I mean, I was a little bit too quick. The buck is back in to the left, and it was a small tree on the left hand side. And it flipped the tree. And it actually broke the, the shocks at the back and the tram rods at the bottom that was holding the axle in place. That broke off. And the buck is slided, and we were like. <coughs> So just try to get out and get the guys not to keep on us. So uh, I mean, we just fix it to come out. So uh, unfortunate, it's very, very unfortunate. Disappointment doesn't have a nice taste, does it? Especially not after having gone 800 k's already. But off-roading is cruel. In second in Class B, it was Derek De Toy and James Hutton in their bat, closing in on De Bruyne and Brits with every second. with a slightly modified Raysonics Nissan hard body in second in Class D. But now they were 17 minutes down. A lot more air conditioning on that car now than when they started off. Yato was still smiling as class E leader Yanni Fisser and Yorks Leroux came barging and bustling by. They had a 20-minute lead. With Jack Peckham and Lucia Santoro setting the times for the lead in class E in the diesel Ford Ranger. But rolled here's the rub. They were feeling the heat as Debold van Breda and Johan de Toy were closing down on them at a rate of knots. And indeed they were on it. After three hours of racing and just before the DSP, it was two-time seasonal winner Duncan Foss and Louis Weitelt who were being hunted by a whole gaggle of very eager super production car class racers. And Henry and Maurice Matten's Nissan Roby steady as she goes in ninth place and leading class D. And for Shamir Variawa and his co-driver Siegfried Rousseau, it was a matter of keeping it on the road, keeping her pointed in the right direction and not erring at all. They were just two and a half minutes ahead. The Toyota Kalahari Botswana 1000 Desert Race nears the finish line right after this. Keep that seatbelt fastened. Vehicle and